the Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. Oh, thank you so much, Madam Speaker. And it's really an honour to rise here again today to speak to Bill uh, C-15, an act respecting the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, because I cannot reiterate strongly enough how this bill is so long overdue. Because, Madam Speaker, Canada was built on the violent dispossessions of lands and resources of Indigenous peoples. It's the kind of violence and genocide that we see perpetrated against Indigenous women and girls, 2S, LGBTQQIA individuals, sacred life givers, including our Mother Earth and waters, where we see a continuation of an environmental destruction supported by governments that violate human rights and continue to marginalize and oppress Indigenous peoples on our own lands. And while big oil and big corporations in Canada benefit off resources, we continue to not even have our minimum human rights respected. The most minimum human rights that anyone, Indigenous or not, need to have joy, Madam Speaker constantly having our rights up for debate while corporations benefit. And I, and I want to be honest here today, Madam Speaker, there is actually no political party in this country who has not participated or continues to participate in the violation of Indigenous rights. Indigenous peoples on our very own lands are consistently and constantly a second thought. And our rights often totally, totally disregarded. And this normalization of violating the rights of Indigenous peoples needs to end, Madam Speaker. It's time that our Constitution, our very own Constitution is upheld, which includes Aboriginal rights and title and international legal obligations that Canada has signed on to. Because... Madam Speaker, we need to change this. We need to change the foundation of our relationship from one that was built on hu the human rights violation of Indigenous people legislated through the Indian Act towards creating a legal foundation that is grounded in a respect for human rights of all peoples, all peoples, including Indigenous peoples, the minimum human rights that are articulated in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And although imperfect, I, along with our NDP team, believe that Bill C-15 is a step forward in upholding and protecting the fundamental human rights of Indigenous peoples in Canada. Because, Madam Speaker, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, as I mentioned, is long overdue. And I would like to remind this House what the General Assembly highlighted last December. They indicated that the Declaration, in quotes, has positively influenced the drafting of several constitutions and statutes at the national and local levels and contributed to the progressive development of international and national legal frameworks and policies, end of quotes. In addition, it's also important to remember that the UN General Assembly has reaffirmed the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples for the 10th time since adoption by consensus. This means that there is no country in the world that formally opposes the declaration. Sorry, Madam Speaker. Sorry about that. Now, since the second reading of Bill C-15, 
we have undergone a study and committee, sorry about that, I had a technical issue, with amendments which we are reporting on today. And I would like to take this opportunity to address some of these amendments. Firstly, as a legislator, it is my legal obligation to be clear about the purpose or purposes of any legislation. As such, our party supported an amendment at committee to clarify that Bill C-15 has two purposes, which include to affirm the declaration as having application in Canadian law and, secondly, to provide a framework for the implementation of the declaration. This bill does not Canadianize the declaration, but confirms that the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People has application in Canadian law as affirmed in preambular paragraph 18, which reads as follows in quotes. Whereas the declaration is affirmed as a source for the interpretation of Canadian law, in addition, Madam Speaker, to other legal frameworks, which include Indigenous law, the Constitution, international law, and treaties with Indigenous peoples. This legal reality has been confirmed by the Supreme Court as early as 1987. E even the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal has heavily relied on provisions of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in their rulings about the racial discrimination that First Nations children face living on reserve. The Declaration, in fact, Madam Speaker, has provided a source for legal interpretation for courts and tribunals and protection of children, families, and communities. Our children need this legislative protection to ensure that they are able to thrive, not just survive, to ensure that children and families are afforded the legal protection to ensure that they can live with dignity and human rights, especially with the current government who willfully violates their rights. As former Chief Justice Dixon confirmed in 1987 in quotes, the various sources of international human rights law, declaration, covenants, conventions, judicial and quasi-judicial decisions of international tribunals, customary norms must in my opinion, be relevant and persuasive sources for the interpretations of the Charter's provisions." End of quotes. Another significant amendment to Bill C-15 I would like to highlight is the inclusion of the Living Tree Doctrine in Preambular Paragraph 19. This is a critical amendment. The Living Tree Doctrine recognizes that the rights, that rights are not frozen in time and that rights and treaties need to evolve over time as our nations evolve and circumstances change. The Living Tree doctor, Doctrine is an important constitutional principle which has also been affirmed by the Supreme Court of Canada. An example, uh, Madam Speaker, I'd like to highlight, in fact, is in 2004, same-sex marriage reference case, the court emphasized that the Constitution is, in quotes, a living tree subject to, in quotes, progressive interpretation. The Supreme Court in the case ruled as follows, in quotes, the frozen concept reasoning runs contrary to one of the most fundamental principles of the Canadian constitutional interpretation, that our constitution is a living tree which, by way of progressive interpretation, accommodates and addresses the realities of modern life. And in Hunter versus Th Southam Inc. case in 1984, the Supreme Court described the doctrine in the following way. In quotes, a constitution is drafted with an eye on the future. It must therefore be capable of growth and development over time to meet the new social, political, and historical realities often un unimagined by its framers. For example, Madam Speaker, failing the $5 given to treaty people during treaty days every year should have gone up with inflation. And I would argue that it is not a symbolic act, but an act of bad faith. Let's not forget that Canada was built on the violent and ongoing genocide of Indigenous peoples. 
And this is why this amendment is so critical. We need legal tools to hold the government to account when they act in bad faith. Like, really, Madam Speaker, $5 failing to take into consideration inflation or compensation owed for destroying lands, impairing our ability to participate in traditional forms of sustenance, perpetuating violence in our communities and leaving many unsheltered on our very own lands while masses, the masses and corporations continue to privilege off the human rights violations of Indigenous peoples. Gross privilege. Because, Madam Speaker, since the time of invasion, our nations have gone through change, whether by choice or as a result of aggressive assimilation policies, which transformed our families and nations. And although our colonizers set out to eradicate us, we are still here, standing strong in protection of our rights, the very rights that our ancestors put their lives on the line to protect. And we are still in this battle, Madam Speaker, whether it be in the courtroom or at the end of an RCMP sniper gun as witnessed in Wasowetan territory or the military siege of Ganazatake, we continue to stand strong. Yet now we see the very little land that has not been exploited still under threat, which makes us stand even stronger. We will never concede our rights and our rights evolve and change over time. These are indigenous lands, yet we still have to fight for crumbs. A disregard of our treaties and lack of good faith by governments to respectfully interpret the meaning, intent, and the letter of our treaties. I have not forgotten. We have not forgotten and we will never, ever forget. And this is also an important constitutional principle, Madam Speaker, which is why the new preambular paragraph 19 is so important as it states in quotes, whereas the protection of Aboriginal and treaty rights recognized and affirmed by Section 35 of the Constitution Act of 1982, is an underlying principle of the value of the Constitution of Canada and Canadian courts have stated that such rights are not frozen and are capable of evolution and growth. And I would suggest, Madam Speaker, in particular, in this particular instance, that UNDRIP is a new political, historical, and certainly legal reality that Bill C-15 is acknowledging. I must admit, however, that I would have preferred that this addition would have been in the operative articles of Bill C-15. In fact, I believe that it actually belongs in the operative articles as some has proposed, in fact. However, I also recognize that the preambular paragraphs have legal effect as confirmed in the Federal Interpretation Act, Article 13. Madam Speaker, um, the last amendment uh, I, I wish to speak to is the addition of systemic racism as one of the measures to com combat injustice and human rights violations against Indigenous peoples. Because, Madam Speaker, we have, a, we have serious issues with systemic racism in this country, and we have witnessed examples that have cost lives in this country. The many, for example, Indigenous lives that have been lost at the hands of police, Aisha Hudson, Jason Collins, Colton Bushi, the late Joyce Eshaquan, who lost her life trying to get assistance in a healthcare system who, that intimidated her, mocked her, disrespected her life and let her die under their care like her life was of no value, leaving her children without a mother and her partner widowed. Or the continued lack of action to address the ongoing genocide against Indigenous women and girls. And the fact that we see a rapidly rising movement of white nationalism and a growing number of white supremacists around the world and right here in Canada, this, this is a critical amendment 
to Bill C-15. Madam Speaker, we need to move forward in a manner that ensures that all Indigenous people can live with dignity and human rights in Canada. We need to begin living up to our identity as a country that values and respects human rights and models behaviors and decisions that actually reflect that. That is still not happening in Canada as we are witnessing with the continued violation of Indigenous rights because, Madam Speaker, although the rhetoric continues that we are all equal in Canada, there continues to be very clear divisions between the oppressed and the oppressor, and the Canadian government continues to per perpetuate a relationship of violent settler neocolonialism in real time. No action plan to address the ongoing violence against Indigenous women and girls to us LGBTQQIA individuals two years late. Ten non-compliance order to immediately end racial discrimination against First Nations children on reserve. Unequal access to health care and education. Continued inaction. A mold crisis. Failure to end all boil water advisories on, on reserve in spite of the Liberal promise to end this by 2021. The number of kids, children in care more than at the height of residential school, the highest level of unsheltered individuals in this country as a result of the violent dispossession of lands that met, left many of us homeless on our own lands. Continued violation of land rights, privileging corporations over upholding the human rights of Indigenous peoples. Ganesatake, Site C, TMX, Keystone XL, Muskrat Falls, Wasoatan Territory, Baffinland, Mary River Mine, 1492, land back not limited to. A continuation of violating the Supreme Court ruling, in fact, in the Mi'kmaq fishing dispute even after more than two decades after that decision was made. And we continue to see a violation of our constitution and international legal obligations in this house we are obliged to uphold as members of parliament. And the list goes on. And the violation of indigenous rights by the current liberal government is not even limited to Canada, but is perpetuated globally. In fact, a Toronto-based justice and corporate accountability project a legal advocacy group noted that in quotes, 28 Canadian mining companies and their subsidiaries are linked to 44 deaths, 403 injuries, and 709 cases of criminalization, including arrests, detentions, and charges in Latin America between 2000 and 2015 stating, in quotes, the financial and political backing that the government of Canada has provided to its mining companies has been strengthened by the de facto conversion of its cooperation agencies into mining invest in investment promotion bodies. This working group reported human rights violations by Canada against Indigenous peoples related to mining in Venezuela, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, Guatemala, not limited to, and what we are watching unfold right now on the news and social media in Sarik Jahar, Jahar and Canada's turning a blind eye to the ethnic cleansing, failing to uphold international legal obligations where children and loved ones continue to die. Another gross example of Canada and the privileged picking and choosing of when to uphold human rights, when it suits economic interests and does not threaten power and privilege. This must change. And I share this with you, Madam Speaker, because although we are working towards passing a bill to affirm the application of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People into Canadian law, in addition to other legal frameworks, including Indigenous law, international law, our constitution and treaties, we consistently fail to uphold rights. We must move forward in a manner that upholds these human rights in Canada and around the world. Lives depend on this, Madam Speaker. We have moved beyond a time where rhetoric 
cuts it and we know that the violation what the violation of rights looks like in real time denying individuals of their right to live in dignity sometimes resulting in death we need to change this lives are on the line so although c15 is not perfect it it's it's a start and we must that must be followed with action it is only then that we will achieve justice there is no reconciliation without justice.